Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me today. This is the Spicy Pecan Podcast. Have you ever had a dream that that you um you had you 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 could you do you you want you you could do so you you do you could. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Spicy Pecan Podcast. My name is Nina. I am your host. And as you can see, we are missing our co-host today. Um, Liz had to take the week off and she will be joining us next week. Actually, we have a very, very special show planned for you next week, which I'll, I'll get into a bit. Um, But listen, if you are watching this on YouTube, make sure to click the like button and subscribe. And if you're listening to me on the pod directories, iTunes, Pandora, Spotify, be sure to leave us a review and also share the show with someone who you think would like it. All the support is greatly appreciated. Um, You know, it's what keeps us going. And also it's free 99, so it don't cost you nothing to do. So definitely appreciate it, guys. Um, this week, my quote of the week, since I'm the only one, <laughs> my quote of the week this week is, keep your hands to yourself and watch your tone. Okay. If you don't know where that is from, that is from one of our favorite shows here, 90 Day Fiance. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, this The show is actually heating up. It's actually starting to get good. Um, there's still like a couple or two that are boring as hell. Um, but, you know, we'll get into all of that. I wanted to catch you guys up on some really, really cool things that have been happening. Um, You know, once I started this podcast uh, and things actually started to get a little bit of traction, um, I started getting different requests from people from all over. And one of the really cool people that I got a chance to meet was Samantha Thompson, who we interviewed at least twice for two different projects that she has been in. She's directing now, y'all. Okay, my girl is directing. And, you know, we are just so proud. We love indie anything here. So, um, oddly enough, she hit me up and she said, hey, I have, um, you know, a very, very small part, one line, but it's for you. So why don't you come out to uh, North, uh, Northern New Jersey and come film with us, which I did. It was really cool. I got an opportunity to meet the cast of her new web series called Lick. And it premiered about two weeks ago on YouTube. So if you Google Lick, L-I-C-K, the series, it will come up. The second episode, guess who's in that, y'all? This one. Yes, I made my actoral debut and I was so hyped. <laughs> I, it doesn't take much to get me hyped, really. Um, but I was so hyped. I will leave the, the link of the, um, the, the episode that I was in in the description for the website. So definitely check that out and support the series um, if you are into indie. And I got to keep it real. The show is actually, um, it's heating up. Like, it's actually really good. So check it out. Let me know what you think. Another really cool opportunity that came along my desk was uh, hosting a panel. Originally, it was supposed to be a panel, but it ended up being a discussion between myself and another creator named uh, Anna uh, Deshawn, who owns a um, an app called The Cube. So <clears throat> I'll back up a little bit. I met podcasters unlimited two women they run a show called pod cypher but they have a podcasting group a network um called podcasters unlimited and they run this pod uh pod conference uh every year i think this was actually the second year but it's called pod work and i got an opportunity to have that discussion with anna deshawn she has an app called the cube like i mentioned and it is curated content for the lgbtqi space 
um, specifically people of color within that space. And it's music and podcasts. So I got a chance to chop it up with her. Really, really awesome person, wealth of knowledge, has been in the podcasting um, industry for several years and has been pretty successful at building this network. So if you get an opportunity, pod work, um, that video should actually still be available. I don't have access to that clip yet, but if I do, I will share that. Um, but if you check them out on Instagram, Podcasters Unlimited, you should be able to see some clips from that pod conference. And I was super excited to be a, pod, a part of it. Podcasters Unlimited is run by two women, uh, Denise Duran and Ann Smith, and they have been phenomenal. I've been on their show called Pod Ciphers, really, really good podcast that's out there. Um, and they interview people of all walks of life. Um, you know, I've just been really, really lucky to meet amazing people because of the podcast. So it's been really cool. Like it's been a very, very cool experience and I'm super grateful. And thank you so much to those women for, um, you know, inviting me to, to your spaces. So thank you. And if you ever want to invite myself or Liz to anything that you might be doing, feel free to email the show spicy pecan podcast at gmail. And we will certainly take a look and try to make it if it if we can. So popping right into the news, um, there's always a lot going on, but obviously the story that uh, you know rocked us all was uh, the shooting that happened in Buffalo, New York. A madman uh, killed ten people in Buffalo, New York, at Topps Grocery Store. Um, just really, really tragic stuff. And I won't dwell on it too much, but what has been pissing me off the most, well, not the most, the incident itself pisses me off. The fact that something like this can happen pisses me off. But the way in which this story is being reported just boils my blood. First of all, let me let you know, the the man who committed this crime we're gonna call him a man because that's how they treat black young teenagers and kids when they commit crimes they're automatically um you know adults so we're gonna call him the man that he is his name is peyton gendron and peyton decided to drive several hours away from his hometown into buffalo buffalo new york into a black community and kill 10 people, most of which were seniors. So a whole bunch of people lost their older uncles, aunts, grandparents. I mean, it's just, just disgusting. The fact that if you're gonna do some mess, do it in your own neighborhood. But we're not even in your neighborhood probably. So how you could be have something so far up your butt against black people that you would do all of this is just absolutely crazy. So a statement or uh, he released a manifesto. And in that manifesto, he said, I'm simply a white man seeking to protect and serve my community, my culture and my race, your culture. My problem with white people who believe in these stereotypes is one what is exactly your culture what is your culture is just being an american your culture because last i checked i'm considered an african-american okay white people you're not native to this land you stole this land you are european american you're european american you know, the fact that these people get to walk around and act like everyone else is a visitor but them, this is not your land. I don't know what we need to do to make sure that you understand that memo, but you are not native to this land. You killed them. And this is another thing that bothers me in the way that this is being reported. Why do we let white people act like everybody else is just so scary and dangerous when they're the ones that are the most dangerous of all of us? Why are white people so afraid of black people? 
Yes, we have an issue with crime that happens in the inner city, but yo ass don't even live there. So the fact that you walk down streets and clutch your purse like black people are just out here killing white people, that's never been the case. I am so sick of these people walking around like everybody else is so dangerous. You're the dangerous ones. You were the dangerous ones. You're the ones who have a history of coming into other people's communities and killing them in numbers. You're the ones who are the biggest threat to America domestic terrorism you're the biggest threat you have always been the biggest threat you have always been the ones who if we're listing out numbers of atrocities and who is actually dangerous and who has the balls to walk into a church and just shoot it up who has the balls to just walk into a grocery store and shoot it up if you're so worried about quote unquote black on black crime, how come you never pull this stuff in the hood where the fellas at? How come you never come to Chicago or Camden and, you know, try this stuff there? How come you never go to gang communities, gang activity areas and pull this stuff? You always want to go to the church. You want to go to the grocery store. You want to go to places where people are so unassuming of anything like that happening. Yet we're the dangerous ones. The way that they're reporting on this, this, this guy, you would think that he was just this lone, lone wolf by himself. How did he do this? He came from a good family. How, why would he do something like this? Well, I'll let you know something. The profile of mass shooters, they typically come from good families. They're typically not the isolated person that is the weirdo that lives in the basement. They typically have friends and are social and come from means. These aren't the trailer park trash, racist, you know, people that we would think that they are. These people typically come from middle-class families that shouldn't be complaining about shit because not only was this country designed to benefit you, but you've already gotten the American dream. Most people are busting their ass with one, two, three jo jobs, trying to get out of the hood, into the suburbs to give their kids a better life. And you're sitting there pretty and still got problems still think that somebody is coming for your spot who's who's replacing you who is replacing you no one but you know what you did you slaughtered so many native americans so many black people just i don't even think it was a full year was it a full year that we saw texas border patrol on horseback whipping haitian immigrants who should be scared here? You see how hype I'm? <laughs> I, get, I get so frustrated because you're gaslighting us. You're gaslighting us and I'm so sick of it. It's your kids that go into schools and shoot them up. It's your kids, but you so scared of everybody else. Everybody else is coming to replace you. Everybody else has a problem but you don't, you seem to have it all right. Like it, it just, it blows my mind. A um, couple of other things I just wanted to mention here. Um, oh, Peyton Gendron, I'm gonna keep saying his name because I'll be damned if these people in the media try to give this guy some ready-made lifetime movie serial killer name like the killer da da da, da like um the buffalo you know mass shooter or no peyton gendron the bastard peyton gendron not suspected not alleged not any of that stuff the murderer Peyton Gendron has been having these types of thoughts and feelings since he was 12 years old. He's now 18. So for about six years, this has all been stewing in him and you're telling me his parents had no clue? 
Body armor, no clue. Machine gun, no clue. Yet we're the bad parents. Yet we're the ones that come from these fatherless communities. Yet we're the ones that are doing all the crime. We're the promiscuous ones. We're the ones having abortions. We're, they just throw everything that they possibly can on everybody else but them gaslighting. It's you and your trifling ass. It's your kids that are coming into places like churches and schools and shooting them up. White people, and it's not all white people. I got that. I got that. And the white people who are watching this right now, you know whether it's you or not. So take it with a grain of salt if you know it ain't your ass. All right? But what drives me crazy, the, 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 the thing that really drives me crazy and I feel like is what all of this boils down to is that most people believe that the reason why most black people are in hoods, the reason why most black people are under the poverty line, the reason why the black community has the ails that it has is their fault. That's why all of this is happening. I mean, aside from racism, obviously, and all of the history, where we are in present day, keep it real with yourself. Keep it real with yourself for real right now. Do you believe that it's black people's fault? Why the hood is the way that it is? Why black, quote unquote, black on black crime exists? You believe it's black people's fault. And I'm here to tell you that systematically, they already knew what they were doing. Black people left to their own devices have shown that they will build communities, that they will build wealth, that they will succeed, strive. Black people interrupted looks like Black Wall Street being burned down. Black people interrupted and we can go on and on and on to so many examples of how white people have stopped black progress because they feel that the better we do, the, the further it pushes them behind, the worse that they're gonna do. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you lose your right to vote when we were able to gain the right to vote? Did you? Did you lose your political power? No, you did not. Did you lose the right to be able to get married when interracial couples were able to get married? No, you did not. You're not losing shit and no one is here to replace you. If we could replace your ass, we probably would and half the people trying to do it will probably be white because they're sick of the shit too. There's a lot of white people that are tired of this shit. Tired of hearing about it, tired of dealing with it, as are we. And let me just remind you guys of something. The hood is not that far removed from crack being placed in it. So most people, if you were in your 30s, that means that your parents probably there's a big chance that your parents were affected by the crack epidemic, whether they be users, whether they be pushers, or whether they just be the people in the neighborhood that saw the devastation and ravage and had to deal with all that trauma and sit in it. We are not far removed from even that. And it is proven. It just blows my mind, man. It really does. It really blows my mind that so many white people feel like our progression is their oppression. It's gaslighting. And we fall for it. And I see black people fall for it. Let me just tell you one quick story. Two or three weeks ago, I was in Philadelphia um, working on an anti-gun violence um, initiative. And we were asking people in the community, we want, this is what we were saying, 
we were saying that we wanted the Philadelphia budget to reflect safe communities. It should be a reflection of our moral standings, meaning if we're not investing in schools, we're not taking having safe communities seriously because every study shows that where there are thriving schools, where the schools are fully funded, crime goes down because opportunities open up. Where jobs and economic opportunities are abundant, crime goes down. So when the government pulls funds out of specific towns, it's purposeful and they know what's going to happen. So we're sitting here and I'm asking people, what can your local government do to ensure that the budget reflects the need for safety in our communities? What can we be demanding of our legislators in this area to be doing in terms of where they're putting the money so that we have safer communities here? I was very, I, I don't wanna say shocked, but I was, I was sorta shocked and disappointed. Black person after black person after black person told me, well, if these parents wasn't trying to be friends with their kids, we wouldn't have all this violence. Well, if these kids would, um, you know, just put down the guns and if they would just give them some sense about them, we wouldn't have this gun violence. Nothing about money into the schools. Nothing about better community policing programs. Nothing about after school programs. And I had to look to the person that I was doing this initiative with. And she, I explained to her, I'm like, man, a lot of black people are blaming themselves. And I'm not saying there's no fault in the, in the community itself, but a lot of black people are blaming themselves to structures they did not create. She said, Selena, that's my government. She said, sometimes the hardest part about this job is explaining to people that there is a bigger game being played. We are so entrenched in white supremacy that people blame themselves for the station that they are in life. They don't understand that this at a higher level is being looked down on as just little pieces, just little pieces of a bigger plan. Let's take a couple hundred thousand dollars out of the school system. Let's shift it into the police system. Let's shift it into prisons. Why? Because we know when we take these funds out, crime is gonna go up. And that means we can shift all of those dollars because crime equates to dollars over here and who benefits and who ends up suffering we can get all into that a lot more but i just wanted to i just wanted to share that because if you if you can't take yourself out of the situation and look at it in a bigger lens because you can literally see the model in cities across the country so it's not just a coincidence and it's not as if we're saying that or it's not as if you could believe that black people are inherently bad. We know logically that that is not the case. So what is actually happening? And when you look at it from a higher view, you can see that when people say it's systematic, that means it's baked into all the rules. So saddest thing I just I want to give my condolences to the community to the friends and family of everyone who lost someone that day um, it's going to take a really really long time for the community to get back um, but I know that there are many many organizations that are still traveling to the area to um, help 
in any way that they possibly can. But we have to know that this is not the last time. And if we're looking at the news and we're looking at the government response, this is definitely not the last time because they ain't doing shit. And on the news, they're reporting it as if COVID made them do it. All of a sudden, the insanity aspect is being brought up. I don't remember y'all bringing up any insanity when it came to Mike Brown. He was grown. And meanwhile, Mike Brown was 18, right? Mike Brown was a teenager, but you wouldn't have known it by the way they reported. The way they reported on him, he was a grown ass man. So that's how we're gonna treat Peyton Gendron. Bastard. On to some lighter news. Let's lift it up a bit. Take a deep breath. I'm going to Puerto Rico. And that's the good news I wanted to tell y'all. So we are going, Liz and I are going to Puerto Rico. We are going to be, I don't know exactly what the show is going to be next week, um, but it's going to be snippets of the trip. And I am so, so excited. Probably the next two episodes are going to be uh, snippets of the trip because I am just so excited. This is the first time I'm going. I am the last of the grandchildren um, to pretty much go. So this means a lot to me, um, you know, culturally and just psh, mama need a vacation. Like, yes, it has been a long time since I've been on a real vacation. I've done some little weekend road trips and stuff like that, but this is going to be the first in a while. So super grateful about that. Let's hop into the shows real quick because it looks like I'm already running over time. Um, we do have an interview that I'm excited about, uh, which let's jump into the shows first and then I'll get into um, who we are interviewing and um, how dope it is. So 90 Day Fiance, are you guys watching? <sighs> it is actually starting to get good. So uh, Bilal and Shahida, the, or Sh Sh Shida, Shida. Um, oh my gosh. Is anybody over him? I am over him. I find him to be so rude. He is just swinging his thing, just marking up his territory, showing, trying to show who's boss or whatever stick is up his butt. He's an ass. I do not like him. He keeps testing her. And I just feel like he has like this overblown sense of self. And he's really just trying to show like, I'm the man, I'm going to make up the rules. You ain't going to be doing this type of stuff. I mean, honestly, if, if I was her, I feel like she should just, um, I would go back home. She's a beautiful girl. She should not have any problems finding someone. And he is, I mean, he's bull crapping her about having kids. You know, she's still young. She wants to have kids. He already has his family. I just feel like this whole situation is a lose-lose for her. Yeah, girl, he got a little money, but it ain't that serious. It's really not. It's not. You would probably be happy with a lot less if the person treated you the way that you want to be treated. And clearly this man is not doing it. And I don't know that he even has the capability to do it. <coughs> I know for a fact he ain't getting away with half these shenanigans with the women out here. And that's probably why he had to import his. I'm just keeping it real. Sorry. Jabri and uh, uh, Miona, uh, mama is trying it. Mama is not feeling Miona at all. Um, I'm kind of starting to lean a little towards Miona's side, but I get where everyone's coming from. Um... Miona is definitely a hot mess. She is high maintenance and I get why mom would be concerned and mom is poking holes in the, like mom is really trying to end, shut this thing down. <laughs> like she really is trying to shut this down and I'm not mad at her. Um, so Benny and Avi moved finally or they're in their new apartment um, in Princeton and it seems like things are slightly going well. You know, there's concern about finances and stuff like that. I mean, I feel like uh, she she's kind of pushing it a bit. Like she's really stressed out about all the finances, but the reality is her parents are not gonna let her get evicted. Her, their names are on the lease. <laughs> so, I mean, like, calm down, girl. You've been here, you've been back in the country 
for a couple of days. Ain't nobody expecting you to move mountains and your parents are not going to leave you high and dry. I get that. Yes, you were partnered with someone who really does not take these things as serious as, as seriously as you do. But take a deep breath. Like you ain't asked out. Like, you know what I mean? Let's be serious here. Um, He did kind of annoy me when he started talking about being an MMA fighter. I'm not going to lie. I just looked like it's a pipe dream. But hey, you know, live out your dream. Just make sure you got a second job because that is not going to pay the bills. Uh, Patrick and Thais... I feel like they have the most interesting story on the show right now, aside from Bilal and Shida. Um, <laughs> drunken brother is going to be a problem. Like, he is going to continue to be a problem. That is clear. He seems like he's a problem in his own life. He seems like he is definitely living with his brother for a reason. Um, there's a lot going on there. And younger brother absolutely seems to have himself together a lot more and ap seems like a place for big brother to fall. So, I mean, I could be totally wrong. That's kind of what I'm picking up from the show. Um, but yeah, the brother is definitely like, they need somebody else to mediate this because this is gonna be a hot mess. She's already slightly a hot mess and then add that to drunken brother and passive boyfriend um yeah i don't really see that going well and honestly um not too there was nothing on um emily and kobe this week i was hoping but that's the juiciest one right now or one of them so they're holding us off till next week and yo guillermo and the redhead i i, I can't even remember her name they're, they're so corny they're so boring i hate their whole storyline get rid of them like I get annoyed just even seeing them on the screen. Like, I'm sorry. Y'all tell me how y'all feel about it, but they annoying as hell. And I wish that they would get, like, it's just not good TV. Um, I wanted to throw something in here. Since, you know, since Liz ain't here this week. Do y'all watch Bad Boys? Or do y'all have Zeus Network? If you do not and you like Ratchet TV like I like Ratchet TV, get yourself some bad boys because this show is off the damn chain. It is really good. Like, I don't know why I like Zeus Network so much. I am so trifling, but I love it. $4.99, I think it is a month. Get it for like a month and just catch up on all their... It's, it's just so ratchet and good. Like, I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't be supporting that because I stay talking about empowerment of our people. But I mean, it is a black owned network. So, you know, at least we're making the own, our own money off of it rather than white people pushing us into this stuff and making the money off of it. Um, yes, the network should tone it down a bit, but I'm telling you, $5 is worth it for a month to catch up on all these ratchet shows and check out Bad Boys first, the fights, the drama, the lingo, the clothes, the everything is just, it's good. So definitely check that out. Listen, we have an interview this week. I got an opportunity to interview Nick Wilmer. Nick is a friend of the family, has been for a long time, but I just recently met him. He is friends with Liz's daughter. Um, and they've been friends since like junior high or something like that. Nick is, he's, he's really, really interesting to me because he sits in a lot of power. He is a white man, but if we want to use the term woke, I would definitely say that that is a self, that is a deserved title here. And I was really excited to bring him on the show because I don't hear a lot of this language that I hear from him, from a lot of people that look like him. So um, we're going to be talking about, and I think this is really needed, we're going to be talking about sexual, uh, sexual identity and gender, and gender identity. Um, I think this stuff is really important because it's becoming more pronounced in our everyday lives. If you have an office job, more than likely you've come across someone with their pronouns or you've been asked, what are your pronouns, which means... You're talking to someone and you're saying, how would you like for me to identify you? 
we are in a different age. Remember, none of this is new. This is has been in existence for a very long time. We just have brand new language for it. But the non-binary, you know, world and everything that sexual identity and gender identity encompass, because we now have the language for it and because we are in a time where people can be a lot more open, you are going to run in to instances until it's basically customary you're going to run into instances where you're going to be confronted with someone's gender identity and if someone tells you that they do not identify as a male or a female you know you got to contend with that we got to roll with it so without further ado i will introduce nick wilmer mm -hmm. So I am so excited. We are joined by Nick Wilmer. Um, how are you doing today, Nick? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, Nick and I actually, Nick is a longtime friend of my cousin who happens mm -hmm. to be Liz's uh, daughter, Brianna. Mm -hmm. And you guys have been friends since like middle school, right? No, close. Uh, since I was a sophomore in high school and Brie was a senior. Okay. And not to get too mushy, but like you guys are like an incredible family, like such Aww. nice people. Like I love you guys. Oh, we love you too. I got a chance to meet you recently at a, mm -hmm. uh, a gun violence protest, um, like gun violence prevention, um, uh, like intervention protest that we were doing in, that was in Trenton, right? Yeah. Yeah. In Trenton. And I actually had the pleasure of being able to drive you home. And in that ride, we got a chance to just kind of chop it up. And I was like, who is this guy? Like, he is awesome. Who is this person? Um, Thank you. So I'll, I'll kind of kick it off. What first, um, what generation are you and Brie considered? I think me and Brie are both Gen Z. Gen Z. I... Yeah, because she's only a year older than me, so I think she's Gen Z. I think, um, not to get, like, I hope this isn't too deep too fast, but um, oh, I think I've heard the popular definition be, if you can remember life before 9-11, at least even as a little kid, you would still be, like, the youngest of millennials, whereas even if you were alive and you can't remember anything, I think that's Gen Z, so I think that's me and Brie. Yeah that that makes perfect sense actually that makes perfect sense mm. um so today we're going to be talking about um as you know i'm a lesbian woman but i am on the higher mm -hmm. end of like that millennial time frame i'm 37 and i think like the cap is like i think people in their 40s are still considered like millennials so mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that your generation and I'm very thankful has ushered in. Um, and we're gonna be talking about uh, things that concern like non-binary, understanding some of the terminology, understanding how it kind of serves us and why it's such an important thing. So I'll start off with, how do you like to be addressed, Nick? Uh, like pronoun wise? Mm -hmm. Definitely he am. I am a... Uh cisgender man, which for anyone who doesn't know what that means, transgender is, say someone is assigned male at birth and they want to be a woman, that would be a transgender woman. If someone is assigned female at birth and wants to be a man, that is a transgender man. Whereas as a cisgender man, I was assigned male at birth and that's what I still feel like comfortable with. Okay. And mm. The how you identify is not necessarily tied to sexuality. No. Right? I think that that is where people start to get kind of confused. Um, one, it is kind of a, a chunk of, it's, it's a chunk of information for people to even understand just the gender identity. So people, um, you know, are born and you may or may not feel aligned with what you were assigned or told or what's on your birth certificate um, at birth. So if, you know, for myself, I was born a female, but if for some reason I didn't feel like uh, my experience, my walk in life aligned with what is traditionally known 
um, you know, for being a female, then that's where kind of the gender identity comes in. I'm trying my best. How am I doing? <laughs> no, you're good. Um, not to cut you off, but I appreciate that you said that you're thankful that Gen Z is trying yeah. to be more forward. Thank you for that. I'm very thankful to millennials and like older generations for kind of like taking a lot of the heat because it's not like any of that went away, especially when I was in high school. But I feel like you guys were a lot, you guys a lot of the time took a lot of the heat and like helped, helped us get to where we are now, which still isn't where we need to be, but you definitely pushed us forward. Yeah, we definitely were the first of the the kind of shit starters. Like I think generations right. prior were uh, a lot more comfortable or conditioned to just follow the status quo. Just yeah. by, and I understand, you know, obviously environmental things, um, conditions, social, economic issues um, played a part with that mm -hmm. where you probably didn't have the luxury of even thinking about some of this stuff because you were literally just trying to survive in your environment. So luckily we kind of grew yeah. in a world where we had a little bit of that luxury. I think, you know, my, my mom didn't want to do it the way that her mom did. And then my generation, once we started having children, we definitely, you know, even took that even further. Um, mm -hmm. But just diving in a little, a little more, how do you, um, what's your interpretation of non-binary? Non-binary, you know, that was such an interesting question for me because it made me think like back to being a freshman in high school. I remember I was dating this girl all the time. We're still extremely good friends and talk all the time, but her like good, good friends who we had lunch with every day at like 13, 14 years old, I think she was actually 13 at the time. She, they, sorry, they identified as non-binary at like 13, 14, which to me is like, maybe now in 2022, depending on the area, if you live in New York, if you live in LA, that might not be so outrageous, but for like 2013. In Jersey? In, <laughs> yeah, in New Jersey, that's kind of like, that took some guts, you know yeah. what I mean? wasn't Definitely. like this situation where I don't know I just remember being super like oh like what's that about like I was like really like I just thought that was very cool like hearing like a, a young person who wasn't necessarily in an environment where that would be encouraged or accepted yet to hear them be like I just never felt right being a girl and I don't want to be a man either like just being non-binary being outside of gender as a whole just felt right I just like that's something I very much respected and I also feel and while I might I'm, I think I have to double check this I think the non-binary definition may be more recently made up in more recent years but PBS actually has an official website like the official PBS whatever you would call that. I know they're a public company. I don't, I, don't, I forget what they're yeah, called. Yeah, like they're a broadcast people. company, like yeah. a media company. Their official website has a map actually of um, different cultures throughout the world where they had more than two genders or they accepted transgender people. And, you know, you look a lot, a lot of these days, it seems like a lot of this was accepted before Christian and Muslim colonization. So it seems like in Africa and Asia, um, among various indigenous cultures that was more accepted until that colonization where now now it's coming back where a lot of people have questions to these feelings of like oh so this is why I never felt like this way because people back in the day had the same feeling too and but people think it's this new thing and I feel like part of that misconception needs to be squashed that like this really isn't a new thing it's like age-old questions are finally being answered you know what I mean yeah I, I love that you even frame it that way that is so true and that's one of the um the arguments I make to people my age and a little older that you know none of this information that we're getting is brand new yes we've now created language around it 
But if you look mm -hmm. at, um, you know, uh, sculptures of goddesses and things like that, some of them have both male and female parts. They'll have yeah. a male part and they'll have breasts. Um, mm -hmm. And then I know from, I was obsessed with this series called Clan of the Cave Bear. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's, it basically tracks this young girl and she's living in the cave, you know, in the cave people era. I don't even know how to properly even say that, but, um, you know, and they broached those topics and these are old, old books. And they said that a lot of the shamans, the, the healers, um, people, you know, who would give you premonitions and also help you when you were sick, a lot of those people uh, were homosexual mm -hmm. men. And um, we know that by the way in which they were buried and by drawings and documentation of their lives. So homosexuality was never, or I can't say it was never a, a, a condemned thing because um, I don't know that specifically, um, mm -hmm. but this exactly just to piggyback on what you said, none of this is even remotely new. Um, this isn't like a phase or a fad. And I think mm -hmm. some people like to say that because we find comfort in our old ways of thinking because that's what we know. Um, you know, even if it's abusive and terrible, you sort of kind of find comfort in the the devil that you know, you know, in a way. What do you think? Uh, what do you think gets misconstrued the most when we're talking about gender identity? I think I wish I could give you an answer. I really feel like it's everything as a whole. Because even me describing myself as a cisgender man, or you describing yourself as a cisgender woman, like, I feel like I've had to explain to people, like, no, cisgender doesn't mean I'm trans. Right. Like, I feel like. <laughs> right, little, right. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's very little education around the topic as a whole. And that's why, I don't know, whenever this conversation comes up, I usually, like, I nine times out of 10, I met with a lot of questions and. I met with people who have a lot of questions instead of people who like already know this stuff. And that's why, you know, going forward, if someone has a question, I never assume they mean the the wrong thing. I never assume, assume they mean, mean bad intentions. I assume like, sometimes even if they had bad intentions, I'm like, well, did you know this? Did you know this? Did you know this? And sometimes that changes their minds. And sometimes they just want to still be prejudiced anyway and that's when I just rolled them out I'm like all right I don't need to talk to you anymore like I feel like there's so little education on this and there's so little yeah I guess that there's so little education on this and I feel like you know, social media has made it easier for so many more people to have the resources to do this reading but so many people don't know where to start. Um, hopefully they're watching this podcast, you know? Yeah. But I, ju I just feel like across the board, there needs to be probably more training at jobs, honestly. You are a straight, cisgender, white male. Why and how did you even, how do you find, I mean, it's crazy to say, but how do you find the compassion for this? Because you were literally the, the most protected class in this country mm -hmm. that we call the United States. And really, this is not necessarily, even though I think it's everyone's struggle, it's not necessarily your struggle. This isn't your walk in life. And it's so easy for people when it doesn't directly affect them, when it's not on their very front you know, doorstep, to literally say, that ain't my business. How did mm -hmm. you kind of get into this space and how can we duplicate you? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, I feel like that's a good question. I feel like just having empathy. I think, I feel like one, just having empathy should make you care. Like, even if it doesn't directly affect you, it should still be a problem. And also, um, even that too, like I am uh, bisexual, but I have a girlfriend now. So even then, it's, it's a completely different experience from when I had a boyfriend being perceived as gay versus now having a girlfriend being perceived as straight and having all that 
privilege. Right. Um, it's, it's like weird. It's like weird, you know what I mean? To go from like one unprotected class to like one protected class. But hey, um, so there, I have that experience as well. And then also being Jewish, um, I'm not, at least at this moment right now, I don't, you know, read any religious books, go to any religious, like anything like that. But my grandfather is an Ashkenazi Jewish man. So for anyone who doesn't know what that means, that means his ancestors were all Eastern European Jews. And I feel like a lot of people don't know about the Jewish diaspora either, about how for centuries there have been, you know, white Jewish people in Europe, there have been brown Jewish people in the Middle East, there have been black Jewish people in Africa. Like the Jewish diaspora has every color, every gender, every sexuality. So anything that affects my Jewish brothers, sisters, and siblings. Yeah. You know, that's my problem too, even if I'm not directly affected. And it affect and if it affects, you know, their black brother and sisters who aren't Jewish, now it's my problem too, because if it like if it affects them, like that's just affects my people. So I feel like you know, a lot a lot of Jewish people don't have that same mindset where a lot of white Jewish people especially don't have that same mindset. They don't have that same idea of unity. But for me, I, I want to have that. So I, I want to have the mindset that anyone else's problem is now mine. Yeah. Because, wow. you know. I mean, I, I love that. I think we all need a bit more compassion. I think one of the, it's interesting you bring up religion because for me, what I've noticed is the roadblock with a lot of these conversations, specifically anything that has to do with gender, anything that has to do with sexuality, it's the Bible that's wedged right in the middle mm -hmm. to block you from what happened prior. And like, it takes you away from that history. And it's mm -hmm. such an indoctrinating thing that people will just constantly point back to this book that they don't fully understand and they don't fully understand how it was constructed. Um, and they keep pointing back to that as the source of all knowledge. Meanwhile, we lived for thousands of years prior to that tool being created. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like in so many ways, it's blocked us from actually being in community with each other. It's done mm -hmm. the opposite of what, you know, it's supposed to do. It's divided us and it's it's taken us away from that, that world community. We don't even look at it. You know, it's like, we're the US, we're, you know, you guys are this, I am straight, you were that, you know, we're, we're mm -hmm. not in community with each other. It's, this is right and this is wrong. Um, but if you understand what, like why and how, or how the Bible was constructed and put together and released and, you know, re-released and, um, then you would understand that that is a, it's, it's more a political tool as well. Mm -hmm. And even hope and sexuality, like, it's another thing that's been going around where it's like the word homosexual wasn't even in the Bible until the 1960s. The original interpretation or the original translation meant a man should not be with a boy, meaning pedophilia is wrong, not homosexuality. Oh, wow. I did not know that. A lot. I've seen a lot of like different sources have been, have been reporting on that. Mm -hmm. See, and it's like it's so many little things like that, that it takes, it, it just, it, you know, it just drives me crazy. It's just one of those things that drives me crazy. Where, while I never want to disrespect someone's religious beliefs, um, because I think that, you know, my spirituality is what keeps me, um, you know, grounded. It's what keeps me alive. Like I had a lot of addiction issues in past years and that literally saved my life. So I would never want to downplay someone's, um, but it's a difference between like, spirituality and a oneness with humanity and a religious belief and a rule you know mm -hmm. it's like you know these these lists of rules a asexual that's the that is the that's one of the things that i don't really understand um like asexuality and why that is actually like in the spectrum of things mm -hmm.
Do you know more about, um, you know, asexual and what that actually is? Uh, I think I know a little, yeah. I had some friends in high school and college who were asexual. Um, I think for anything, you know, you can't apply one thing to every single person. So I'm not trying to like generalize. Right, I appreciate you saying that too. Great point. Yeah, so yeah. So from the people I knew, for them, it was like, I guess they just didn't have a sexual drive and they didn't have a sexual attraction for another person. But asexuality is an interesting thing because you can still be straight and asexual. Like you can still, or you could be gay and asexual or bisexual and asexual. So you could still have a desire to want a romantic partner and be romantic, but maybe you don't have a sex drive or you're not just attracted to anybody, I guess. Or you could be aromantic and asexual, which means you're not interested in anybody romantically or sexually. I think it's just an interesting thing, you know, like, I I guess for me and you, like, it's something that we don't understand within our past experiences, maybe, like, it's not something we experience, uh, but then you think about it, isn't there like seven or eight billion people in in the world now? Like, I guess when you think about it, it's like, I mean, I guess not everyone's going to feel the same way, you know what I mean? Like, of course, there would just be so many different variations of how somebody could feel. I feel right. like that's a big part of it. Like, I feel like that's something where when I've heard it come up in conversations, I've heard a lot of people just be like, oh, they just have to wait or, oh, that's just weird. And it's like, I don't I don't think it's weird. Like, I feel like there's just so many people in the world that like, of course, why wouldn't there be somebody like that? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. It's like there is literally a rainbow within every we are we are a complicated species, but that's the beauty Mm -hmm. of it. We can be so many variations of different things. If you think about us being made in the image of God, then we can literally be anything. Like we can Mm -hmm. be any variation of anything. Um, So yeah, no, that's definitely a a good point. Mm -hmm. When it comes to asexuality, just, you know, just out of curiosity, do you think that uh, an argument could be made that just like how men kind of lose their sex drive along the way, that maybe it's a little bit of an imbalance of that because it's not a driver of your sexuality. It's not a driver Mm -hmm. of your sex. It's more just like the desire isn't there, but those are desires that are um, precipitated by chemicals. Mm -hmm. So do you think that like that could be kind of a possibility? Because that's one of the things that I kind of, think of when I think of asexuals it's like I wonder if it's kind of in the same vein of maybe just those hormone levels are just lower than where they Mm. traditionally are for um other people only because it's not a driver for anything else you know Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question honestly like I wish I had done research on that just just to like have some type of answer but I feel like you know could that be a reason sure or could someone I don't know because I feel like most right, let people me, like oh, that you know they yeah. don't they don't True. have any desire and maybe maybe that's why they go into those types of lifestyle because mm-hmm. you know maybe a lot of them you know don't have that desire so it's not as if you're taking anything away from me I, it never was there in the first place. It's not a big ask mm. for me to give that up, you know, so. Yeah, I feel like that's a great question just because, I mean, when I mean, for me, for myself personally, I feel like already to begin with, I feel like we're already kind of stuck in a place where someone has to identify themselves and someone has to have an identity like right now and they have to like stick with it. I feel like this whole conversation of like, oh, it might just be a phase or whatever, like for some people, like it is a like phase or whatever. Like I know people who um, thought they were gay at one point and then, you know, present day, they feel they may be bisexual because they have these thoughts that like, oh, if I like the same gender, I must only be allowed to like the same gender. And then later on, as they got older, they were like, oh, maybe I am allowed 
to not only like the same gender. And for other people, it was the opposite. They thought they had to like both. And then they let their works up that they were gay. I feel like the idea that something could be a phase is something that the a lot of people in the community get very offended by. But I feel like if anything, it should be pretty freeing that, you know, we don't have to be whatever other people want us to be. We don't have to be stuck in one thing for the rest of our lives. Like, I feel like, you know, you know, I feel like everybody should be allowed to like think and experiment if they want to. And if everyone comes to a different, con- that's, that's really the thing. Like, I feel like a lot of people are stuck on traditional gender roles or traditional like sexuality. I feel like if someone has decided that's what's right for them, cool. I just want more education to be shared across the board and more resources to be shared across the board just to make sure that everyone is actually doing what feels right to them not what other people have told them that's right so I feel like I hope that ties into your question just because I feel like you know if if it comes from a hormone imbalance if it comes from just never having those desires to begin with um I hope, I hope that kind of makes sense as an answer because I feel like yeah no I you know, mean, maybe I for some that. people it was a hormone imbalance and maybe they needed to take some kind of something and maybe those desires came back or maybe for some people it wasn't they just never had those desires to begin with and I feel like if either situation happens I don't want to hear like a gotcha moment like oh see it's not a real thing like I still believe it's a real thing even if it was a hormone imbalance for some people yeah and I love the fact that you um you're pretty much encouraging us to give permission to go through phases (laughs) Mm-hmm. No, it is okay for people to do that. You don't have to, you know, you may have come out at 16 and said, I'm gay or I'm a lesbian. And then when you got to college, you may have met someone that changed your experience or opened your mm-hmm. mind a bit and expanded your, you know, yourself. And then in your thirties, you may have married a man or a woman, you know, it's, it, mm-hmm. it's okay to allow people to be their full selves and not be limited by these really invisible rules that we kind of make up for ourselves because Mm -hmm. it it literally is just made up um Mm -hmm. so i know that even for straight people like if a man want i don't know i was gonna say even for straight people like say a young point like and a young man's life, he thought about experimenting. And then he later came to the conclusion, like, no, I just feel straight. Or same for a woman, if she wanted to experiment and then came to the conclusion that these straight that she's straight, I feel like that should be accepted as well. Like, I don't know why everything has to be like a clear cut, like, it's only right. this, it's only ever this. Like, I feel like even straight people and straight cisgender people should be allowed that as well. Yeah. I and think, uh, I'm sorry, what were you guys say? No, I was just going to say, um, I forgot what I was going to say, but just to um, reply to what you just said, I think as human beings, we find comfort in putting things into a box that we can understand. Like I know me, yeah. confusion, I hate being confused. It is like, I mean, mm-hmm. I take it harder than a lot of other people. It just, it's one of those things that like frustrate me so much. And I can understand that, you know, that is kind of in everybody where it's easier to say, oh, this is a black chapstick, you know, not having to explain anything else about it. This is what it is. I can move on. I understand it. But it's okay to have that um, that openness and not a full, complete understanding because it's a whole other person's life, Mm -hmm. you know. Like, it's all right for that to be complicated and messy. It's real. It's a real life. It's a real human being life. Um, But I did want to ask you, um, you know, uh, as we kind of wrap up a little bit, how do you think this plays into people even younger than us? Some of the criticisms that, um, you know, gay people have gotten over the years is your lifestyle is um, affects younger people simply by them being exposed to seeing it. So Mm. it encourages, um, you know, homosexuality simply uh, because they can view it. How do you, how do you feel about that? Being someone who is, uh, you know, younger than me, you're a little closer to younger people. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Does that resonate with you at all? Did you recognize that? Like you saw a bunch of gay people and that kind of encouraged you to experiment or try, or how do you feel about that argument? Um, I think I agree that sexuality doesn't need to be exposed to children, but I don't think that's the same as romance being exposed to children. Like, I don't know why, you know, if a kid sees their parents and their their parents are a man and a woman, if a kid sees their parents kiss, cuddle, you know, be affectionate with each other, that's just romance, if not sexual. So I wouldn't know why a gay couple doing that in front of a child, why that's sexual and not romantic and affectionate. So I feel like there's nothing wrong with not necessarily a child being exposed, just a child like just seeing like romance and affection from adults and having that barrier of like, this is what adults do, but adults aren't gonna hide it from you. And this is what children do. Like children don't need to be experimenting or whatever. They should just be kids. Like, I I feel like it should be like that. Like, I don't know why people see, people hear about gay men or lesbian women and they think it's just some sexual thing it's sexual all the time like because I don't think it always has to be in the same way that like I mean obviously I'm not sharing I don't I don't feel I'm not going to share my opinion either which way about this but I've seen a lot of people say you know on the show Euphoria on HBO why are there so many sex scenes and these people are supposed to be minors like they're all actors over 18 but these characters are minors and we're seeing minor couples who are straight couples having sex and we're seeing you know women over 18 but they're playing minors you know showing parts of their body it's like i feel like so much of this is associated with gays but I feel like straight people need to be part of this conversation too, if they want to complain about the same thing. Yeah, I think um, it as soon as you bring up gay, lesbian, anything, it's immediately sexualized. Yeah, and it's the easier way of not respecting the fullness of what it is. You know, it's a Mm -hmm. it's a human experience. Um, I think it's it's very easy for people to condemn because it's immediately sexualized Mm -hmm. um where like you said you know that is such a small just like in any other relationship that is that is such a small percentage of what it actually is you know if you're married to someone and you think that your marriage is just about sex then sure every gay couple is just but um that's not the reality of it you know, it's not the reality. And it is one of those things that we constantly have to come up against, um, especially like being a lesbian. I could definitely relate because I feel like lesbians are so sexualized and it makes people not yes. respect like that title. So mm-hmm. when people see you out, um, it's a game to some people. And it's like, oh, you know, let me join you guys. And, you know, it's it's a lot of that instead of respecting the mm-hmm. fact that you know, um, <laughs> the whole point is that you're not involved. <laughs> like, yeah. That's like the whole thing. Um, no, but listen, I, I absolutely appreciate this conversation. I think this is going to open up uh, some people's eyes. I think that people are going to be surprised. Um, and I appreciate the deliverer because we mm-hmm. need more people that sit in your space in life to be the deliverers of this information. Um, Because, you know, a lot of people just find comfort in sitting in the the back, you know, not really saying too much. And I think it's it's kind of on all of us. And we're seeing that more and more as we, um, you know, as we kind of see the world, it feels like the world is falling apart a little bit. (laughs) The more that we embrace each other and the more that we stop putting all these stipulations and it's okay to not understand something and it is okay to do research and it's okay to not immediately go to the negative of, oh, nope, that gotta be wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. That has to be wrong. Not necessarily, you know, there's nothing that we've spoken about today um, and there's nothing about any of this that is brand new, you know, like you had opened up with. All of this stuff has been around and will continue to be around mm-hmm. for a very long time because it's simply a human experience. 
Mm -hmm. So Nick, thank you so much for being on the show. We got to do this again. Next time we'll do mm -hmm. it with Liz. So she could tell me uh, yeah. stories about how All you were right. as, a, cool. as a teenager. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I mean, I love you guys. Like, I like I love that, like, as soon as you met, you were like, oh, you've known Brady since you were, like, a teenager. Like, you're basically a cousin now. Like, you guys are such a yep, great family. family. Like, very smart people. Like, all of you guys are so smart. Like... I mean, even Brie, like, whether they were, like, teenager in high school, like, I didn't know anyone else who was, like, so passionate about social change and, yeah. like, so involved in, like, the, the political process. Like, like she obviously came from a very, like, smart, like, sensical family. So it, it's just very great to, like, be able to talk more to you guys. Yes, that was such a good conversation. Let me know what you guys think. Are you still confused? Did we kind of go here, there, and everywhere? It's such a big conversation that it's hard to cut it down into, you know, kind of such a short piece. And like I said, this is something that we're going to continue to be confronted with. We're going to continue to talk about. We are all evolved people. Yeah, and we have the capability to understand this. This isn't beyond us. And it's not a hassle. It's not. If you have the ability to allow someone to be fully seen, then we should be capitalizing on that. I, I just, I'm firmly, I firmly believe in that. Even though I, you know, I have a little bit of an easier walk. I am, I was born a woman. I feel like a woman. I don't have a confusion about my gender identity or anything like that. Um, so it is something that because I sit in that position of power slightly kind of I guess um that I can do my part to make sure that I allow people to be fully seen so that was our show this week thank you so much for tuning in be sure to if you haven't already like the episode subscribe if you're on YouTube and if you're on the pod directories leave us a review when you do that they actually boost us up higher they recommend us out to more people and I'm so grateful for all of your support. Listen, guys, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining. Be blessed. Stay spicy. Thank you for listening to Spicy Pecan Podcast. This is a wonderful media production.